Hi, I'm Hannes. I work for a company called Access in Belgium, and we are here at Go to Aarhus. We're sitting in the middle of a construction site, so you can hear some noises in the background. Um, I'm here today with Rob and Ian, um, who are having a talk about uh, dealing with legacy systems. Um, I'm going to ask them to introduce yourselves to the audience as well. Yeah, hi, I'm Rob Horn. I'm a technical principal consultant, work for ThoughtWorks out of our London office. Um, I've been in the sort of software industry for 25-ish, um, 25, 30 years. Um, majority sort of on reflection as part of this work. Kind of at least 60% of that time actually has been spent uh, working with different customers, different clients on what we'd call legacy modernization. We now like to kind of think of it as legacy displacement. Cool. Uh, I'm Ian Cartwright. I'm also work for Fortworks, based in our Manchester office. I've uh, been with Fortworks for about 20 years, and 10 years of that I've been involved in helping pull the tech radar together. Um, yeah, and I'm collaborating with Rob and James Lewis uh, with some help from Martin Fowler on writing up some of the lessons we've learned, some of the patterns we've discovered, uh, based on a lot of work we've done helping clients replace legacy systems. All right, I hear you both speak about legacy systems. Now, there's a lot of ways that we can look at those and that we can define those. Um, for a lot of developers, it means that this is software that I didn't write and don't fully understand. <laughs> yeah. uh, can we maybe get a little bit of a definition in about what you consider to be a legacy system before we yeah. go off into the, the how we deal with that? So. I think there are lots of different legacy, definitions of legacy. We heard one from Alan Kay in, in the keynote uh, earlier this week. I think he called it any system that doesn't naturally rot away, which is certainly one interesting way to view it. But what we tend to find with our customers, it's about the technology that a company has not being able to respond to the needs of the business anymore. And what we mean by that is that maybe they need to get to market faster, or small changes have started to cost too much money, or the cost of running the platform as a whole has become too high. Right. Uh, and then there are technical reasons. So sometimes it turns out somebody's on an end of life platform. You know, they've been told, you know, 18 months time, you won't be able to get technical support anymore. Right. But we've, it is more the business definition. It's that the platform is not meeting the needs of the business any longer that yeah. I think right. we primarily focus on. And if you until you start thinking about end of life software, none of those things you said are actually time related. Yeah. So legacy, by that definition, could actually be something that's been written uh, yeah, really recently to kind of yes. rush a, a kind of get a product to market really, really quickly. But it is causing but, uh, friction for the business. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Or as you scale up and you need to scale out, maybe it's no longer able to to meet those needs right so right so maybe to summarize there is value in the system being there but you're not able to operate it in a way that it would support the business needs properly yeah. I, I think to give an example the, the classic example is often an, a, an older company who's been around many years this system maybe it is an older system mm -hmm. and a competitor comes along and starts to steal some market share right. maybe they have a really good mobile app Mm -hmm. And so then the business go, oh, we need a mobile app or we need to make changes to match the competitors. And to use an example for one client, they spent six months building a new feature uh, on, their, on top of their legacy technology and their competitor did the same. They matched it in two weeks right. because they were on newer, more flexible technology <coughs> that was easier to change and to test and, and all of those good things. Right, and and they couldn't, and because of their mainframe and their legacy, they just couldn't move that quickly, and so that was the thing that was really hurt, starting to hurt their business. Right, so you say that most of these projects are business driven, mm. right? There is mm -hmm. a business need to actually innovate and change things. It could be innovate and change, but it could be um, what well, maybe starts as a kind of a tech led initiative, like the end of life example, actually in business terms represents kind of risk, right? Yes. And risk mitigation. Um, I was recently working with a, a client who are operating a multi-billion pound asset and lease financing company, running middleware on what their vendor said they were the only customer left globally 
running this particular piece of middleware. It's been out of support for many years. So that represents, you know, it's a, it's a technology project. We've got to get rid of the middleware. Yes. We've got to replace our end of life software. But it's a real, real tangible risk to the business that if this thing should go wrong, they can no longer support that kind of revenue generation. So it's always business led. So when you're looking at these displacement projects, um, what is um, one of the things that people often get wrong uh, yeah. when they try to undertake a project like that? Yeah, so one of the things we sort of see as an anti-pattern, it, it can sometimes be useful, but mostly causes trouble, is something we've called feature parity. Right. And so the idea here is um, often, you know, IT go to the business and say, hey, we need to replace this platform. Uh, what do you need in the business? The temp they will say, oh, well, oh, that sounds like it could be really disruptive. I, I might have to retrain my people or I don't want that. So I'll just give me what I've got today. So right. what happens is they, they often then build a huge requirements document that describes all the ways they do the current processes now. Right. And that becomes the spec for the new system. So that's feature parity. It's like, give me exactly what I've got today, but I guess because it's on newer technology, somehow under the covers, things will be better or more reliable or cheaper. And, and the challenge with that is when, when you go and talk to actual end users of the system who use this you know, green screen terminal or whatever it might be, they're like, please, no, <laughs> the last thing we want is something that works. It doesn't work. You know, we, we do half the work on a spreadsheet because the system can't accommodate the way we work now. And we have all these workarounds. Because so keeping that as a spec doesn't make sense. It, yeah. you, you should use this as an opportunity to rethink things. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, right? If you in that kind of situation, you may want to like go through a series of archaeology to understand what your scope and your requirements actually are by looking at the system. But if your business, but a lot of the why is going to be gone, right? Right. Exactly. Right. So you're missing the why. You're also actually missing all of those business processes and journeys that don't happen on the system because the system doesn't support how the business needs to work. Right. So despite all of that great work on trying to work out your scope, you're actually missing a whole load of scope. Plus, there's a whole bunch of kind of features and functionality that the business don't use. Mm -hmm. So that's if you reproduce that as waste. Mm -hmm. um, and like Ian said, right, the last thing the users want yeah. is the system that does the same as what it does now. Yeah. And I reckon there's all, also the um, the business keeps moving forward on the old platform as well. So right. the spec that you make today, um, that platform is going to keep evolving while you're writing the replacement and you're actually never catching up to it. Right? Which I've definitely, I so one of the things I will do is go and help a client assess a long run, running program. And I've done a couple where the the new features going into the old system were being added much quicker than they were to the new system. Oh, okay. And, and so we sat down and we realized the new system that was meant to replace the legacy, mm -hmm. it would never catch up. Okay. And because they hadn't, you know, they they part of the reason was when you do feature parity, that often goes hand in hand with a big bang release. Right, because the business, you know, like I say, they don't want the disruption, and they think, well, I'm going to get what I've got today. So what I can do is, you go away and build that for 18 months, two years, mm -hmm. and then we'll choose a weekend, and we all go home, and on Monday we'll come in, and it, it'll all look the same, but it'll be on the new system. Yeah. So it tends to lead to this big bang release. Yeah. But the problem is that you're Which not. Which is very risky as well. It is. It, it's like <laughs> even if you get to like building up a yeah. feature, is going to be very risky. Yeah. yeah. And the problem is that when you get to big bang and a fixed date, and you've got this big requirements document that often a third party supplier has signed on the line to say, "I will deliver that," and then the business come and say, "Actually, our competitor's done this, or the regulator has changed the rules." Then you get into a change control process right. where the supplier is saying, yeah, but we're doing what's in that document. And, and then now the whole thing becomes a contract negotiation exactly. again. Correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. that's what the, the whole Agile manifesto tells yeah. us to steer away from, right? Yeah. And then the other thing we often see is even if you do manage to succeed, and it, it can work, is often when you look at the business case for replacing legacy, the thing that everybody's forgotten about in the meantime, yeah. it says, you know, faster, cheaper delivery of new functionality, but we've spent two years doing the opposite. 
Right. We spent two years of going away and working to a spec and not giving you any working software. And often, you know, I've seen a couple of clients where they thought they could do two years, do a release, and then transition immediately into a weekly release. Right. But you spent two years practicing how to work in completely the opposite way. And it doesn't work. The next release is suddenly six months, a year out, and the business are going, but hold on, we gave you all this money yeah. <laughs> to get faster releases. What's going on? So what would be a better way to, to tackle that? Yeah. Um, so there's, there's, there's probably some patterns we can talk about because it, we're not saying this is easy. This is a difficult problem. I think in terms of how you go about building the software, we sort of, the only way we've seen really to, to know that you can release frequently is to start building that way from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to show that you can deliver value incrementally frequently right from the start of the, the legacy displacement project. Right. And we just don't know another way in which you can know that you're going to get frequent software releases otherwise. Yeah, it's, unless you start doing it. Unless you start yeah. doing it. It's like the existence proof of faster releases is to do faster releases. But it, it does raise challenges in terms of how you break the problem apart. Because in an ideal world, I guess, at some point in the software, you're going to integrate the old system with the new and use some, uh, some functionality on the old platform, deprecate features and move them to the new. Yeah. Yeah. Something, yeah. a process like that. Yeah, right, absolutely. So we want to think about how can we, like Ian said, break this big problem up into smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. Then we want to start delivering those pieces incrementally. Um, whilst using improving the, on the old technology, imp improving and, and and on, gradually, the old, on the old business processes, mm, even if yeah. we can, yeah, absolutely right. And but but gradually displacing mm -hmm. the legacy rather than replacing mm -hmm. the big bang, hence yeah. our use of that words. Um, but, and like Ian said, like in a way where you, you're kind of transforming or changing your engineering practices to enable you to continue mm -hmm. to do that through you know for the life cycle of this current project and into maybe product kind of mode mm -hmm. and ongoing basis um, to enable you to continually then change afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that, like as you were kind of alluding to, right, you've got a couple of problem sets now. It's like, right. well, how am I going to break the problem up? Yeah, that's that first. a difficult problem in itself. But, you know, there, there's some kind of patterns that we're seeing around how to go about breaking up that, that, that kind of problem space. And then it's given a set of parts, right? How do I now deliver those parts incrementally? And what are the techniques that I maybe need to use yeah. to integrate old world mm -hmm. and new world and kind of keep them separate? And Old technology and new technology, mm -hmm. even it, yeah. it might be that your UI technologies are not going to be compatible at all. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you want to yeah. put it in the hands of the user yes. as a single product. Yeah. yeah. Um, I found that challenging mm -hmm. when, when we were doing yeah. this, uh, a similar migration. Yeah. But, so I mean, if we talk about Breaking the problem up a little yeah, bit. Right? Yeah, I, I think it is definitely when I go and talk to our teams, you know, finding the seams, finding the right way to say, okay, we got this system, it, they've been building it for 10, 20 years. It's running, you know, three quarters of the business are in there. Mm -hmm. How are we going to break that problem apart into smaller pieces? And I think the first thing we've discovered is you have to do that with the business people in the room. Because if you break it up along technological boundaries, that might not allow the business to do what they want to do. Right. So, you know, sometimes someone will say, oh, well, we'll migrate the database, and then we'll mi migrate the business logic, and then mm. we'll migrate the UI. But the problem is that doesn't necessarily, how do you map that onto business priorities? Right. So what we try and do with the business folks in the Has room. Has that ever happened, where you, you take it layer by layer? We've seen people try it. OK. I, I don't think it's been successful. Um, because we're back to the same thing, which is like, oh, well, you know, we're just going to spend 18 months replacing the, the storage layer, uh, but the, the wheel doesn't stop turning. Competitors don't stop mm -hmm. releasing software. No. Uh, and so the business become frustrated because they're like, well, what's going on? You know, we need these new things. And IT tell us there isn't any budget because they're spending it all right. on, on database migrations. So you, you're looking a lot more at vertical slicing the applications and finding features that belong together that make sense to replace as a whole? Is, is that Yeah, we, we, we see different patterns. So, for example, at a retailer, what we found is quite often what you can do is look at product lines. 
Right. So you might say, okay, uh, <coughs> we might do sports wear first, and then maybe we do men's wear, then women's wear, mm -hmm. uh, and then children's wear or so on. And so we're looking for delivering vertical slices of value. Right. But you have to have the business in the room because they're the ones who know which are the most important ones in terms of mm -hmm. revenue. But you also need their agreement that, oh, if somebody's shopping for sports wear and children's wear, for a while they might see a different user experience between right. those two product lines. But that's the compromise we might have to make mm -hmm. so that we can do this incremental delivery. So that's and by, yeah. by involving them into the decision, they also know <clears throat> what the effects yes. of, of what they're going to do is going to be. Yes, there's yeah, no exactly. surprises. And they, and they can tell you like it's important that these features move together because yes. we, we cannot have this experience or that. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. So other dimensions might include uh, customer cohorts. Mm -hmm. So rather right. than product lines, maybe you could target a certain segment or kind of cohort of your customer base. Um, you may there may be some there may be some obvious technology seams as well. Mm -hmm. um, talking of the the value stream or the, the kind of the user experience, there might be steps of that process which are supported by different parts of the business or different sets mm -hmm. of kind of users. So maybe you could in, sort of intersect and kind of slice in a bit of new functionality yeah. up as part mm -hmm. of that flow. Um, or, your, or like a business capability. Again, a kind of previous client was working with their logistics team. Um, right. were kind of responsible for kind of problem exception handling when sort of goods weren't arriving where they needed to, sort of thing. Um, yeah, we were able to prov you know sort of provide their full suite of of, app, of kind of the tooling they needed to do just their mm. part of the job. So that was a, a user cohort. A kind of a value stream yes. and a set of capabilities all in, all in one kind of piece. So. And that means that you're moving one department over um, yeah, possibly yeah, in this at case, a time yeah. Yeah. and focus on, on their part of the, of the system. Yeah, yeah. It, but you have to, I know I keep saying, but you have to have the business in the room because, and also they have to be willing to compromise. We've been in a situation where the business person said, I won't accept half my stuff working on the old and half my stuff working on the new. Okay. And the problem was that was going, that was a blocker for the whole idea. Right. And so it's like, well, if you want faster time to market, you've got to be willing to compromise. Mm -hmm. You know, and there has to be some room to maneuver. Because if you just keep coming saying, just give me what I've got today, you know, we're none of us are going to get what we want at the no. end of this. Yeah. But I feel like in software development in general, it's in a lot of processes, it is valuable to have the business yes. owners nearby. And, and available to you um, as a team. Yeah. Um, usually they go in the direction of like, these people are very busy doing their job, so we're going to put an analyst in between. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, and, and in a lot of cases, that just adds another uh, translation layer between yeah. their actual needs and the team building them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm not saying analysts are bad at all. Um, it's just a lot nicer if you can involve mm. the people. Yeah, um, yeah. I've got some ha very happy memories of uh, spending some time, like kind of a day in the life of, right? Mm -hmm. So going and sitting next, right next to the people doing the day job who are using this mm -hmm. system and it was being replaced, um, and talking to uh, this this young lady who was doing um, some financing stuff, and she was talking me very diligently through her kind of process that she follows, and she described. You know, kind of downloading a report, printing it off, going back to the system, loading up a screen and checking that the list items that, you know, on the screen matched what was in the report. Um, and I Which could have been like a, a batch job that you automated in half a day or... Right. So, and I'd, I'd been spending some time with some architects as well and I'd kind of I had to kind of just would you just explain that to me again? Yeah. You're kind of, you're looking at this, you're looking at this. Are they ever different? <laughs> And she was sort of like, mm, I'm not sure. Went off to speak to a colleague, came back, <laughs> took the page out of her work manual, <laughs> tore it up, threw it in the bin. It's so like just the the because the technology people are not spending time with the business people, they didn't realize that the two things were driven from exactly the same transaction. And I'm, I'm guessing you, you're getting three 
different stories when you talk to these three different groups right. of people. You, you talk to the developers and they'll tell you what's wrong with the system mm. technologically and why they, want, why they want to move. Yeah. And then the business people are telling you about the value stream and, and how this system is not complying to what, what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. But when you talk to the actual users, you get stories like, yeah, this screen is working against me, so I have to work yeah. around. Yeah, like a lot of, some of the business logic is going to be in their heads yes. yeah. and not in the system. Yeah, oh, very much so. I mean, I work with a client where IT couldn't understand why the business all waited till Friday afternoon to input all the weekly numbers. Uh, but they didn't go and ask them. So we went to ask them. And the reason was on a Monday, they extracted all the data from the legacy system into a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. They worked all week long in the spreadsheet. On a Friday afternoon, they imported the spreadsheet back into the legacy system. Okay. So the view of the business in the legacy system for four days a week was completely wrong. And that was why it looked like everybody waited till Friday afternoon to key the data in. Right. They'd been working off a spreadsheet all week. And no one in the bit, no one had sat down and had that conversation. It was it was quite interesting. But that's just layers in the organization, or or need not even layers. Like it could be lateral groups of people not not talking to each other, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. and it's like I say when you, you drive change from technology, you you miss all this nuance. And this this is all scope, right? This is all opportunity for improving business processes, getting better access to data in a more timely way. Um, and you miss all that sort of. Is that is that like a walled garden sort of problem uh, that still exists? The where they see IT as, as something separate from the business. It, it's definitely. I think we we have some clients. I would call them digital native clients. Who they really only exist because of the internet. Right. You know, I could say like some of the travel sites or insurance comparison sites or things like that. They they didn't exist before the internet. Mm -hmm. And there you see very much a much more tighter collaboration that the technology is seen as value generating. But if you talk to older organizations who've been around, you know, 50 or plus years, for them historically IT was a cost. Mm -hmm. That was, oh, we have to have IT to do generate the invoices or to print out the payroll checks or something like that. And so it was always seen as a cost rather than value generation. And unfortunately, that mindset is often still present. And so you get this, you go and talk to IT and they're really annoyed because they're like, yeah, but every year we've asked for more budget to get rid of the system, but the business won't give us the budget. You know, and then you go and talk to the business and they're like, every year IT come with this completely unrealistic number of millions of dollars and we, you know, what, what, what do they think is going to happen? And it's, and it's this attitude of IT as cost versus IT as the value generation part. part of the yeah. yeah. Is that where you see possibilities to avoid this from happening in the, in in the future? I, I think so, and I think, as I say, I think some organisations really understand this. That to them, there isn't the business and IT. There's often like a product team who have tech people in. There's business people in, and they collaborate, mm -hmm. and the technology enables the value generation. Right. And it's the two collaborating together. And I think if you can transition to work in that way, then you will hopefully uh, avoid some of these challenges in the future. That, that you, you, because you're always trying to improve and you've got that strong collaboration, stop right. the walls going up between IT and the business. And the other, I guess, another aspect of the transformation that we want to sort of help clients with is the. Um, the change is the only kind of constant, right? Mm. It's sort of like, well, we need to continually to be able to change. So if I can continue again, agile manifest, yes, right, to exactly, to change. Right? Yeah. So this yeah. is about you know, kind of your your kind of engineering kind of practices and continuous delivery, continuous integration, um, good sort of testing and all that kind of good stuff. Good quality software to enable you to continue to kind of like run and change at pace. Um, to, con to, to continually allow you to switch out, you know, well-architected systems and switch out those parts of the software that may now maybe are kind of becoming or considered mm -hmm. legacy. Because yeah. um, time progresses, new security vulnerabilities are found, you need to be continually updating your system. So if, if you can bake change as something you can continually kind of cope with, mm -hmm. um, then maybe that's when legacy becomes a thing of the past, right? But that takes organizational yeah. change, yeah. not just a project to replace a system yeah. from one thing to another. How do you think 
uh, the idea of citizen developers fits into that whole bringing IT and business closer together because we're getting all this low code, no code tooling mm -hmm. that theoretically should allow yeah. people that are more on the business side to actually scratch their own itch, like yeah. fill in the voids in the existing IT systems. Yeah, I think, I mean, in reality, what, what we're tending to see is where the business has become frustrated with IT, they sort of try and do an end run, they try and go round IT, yeah. and this is some of the conversations that start well, to happen. Well, it could be supported by IT, right? Yeah, I think what, <laughs> what you find, you know, often if they go to IT, IT are like, oh no, you know, we'll, please don't do that because we'll end up having to support it, yes. you know, but often that isn't happening. They don't talk to IT because the relationship's broken down because they're like, you know, they've been telling us they're going to replace the old system for 10 years. They've tried mm -hmm. three times. It still hasn't worked. And I saw this talk at lunchtime how I can just put some doodleware on my laptop and do it myself. Right. Uh, and I think in certain areas it might work quite well, like if report generation or something like that, or analytics, yeah, where like you can just self search. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I think where we've seen it being problematic is where people are defining stuff that ends up on pr in production in front of customers. Right. And then the challenge is... But IT know, has no clue what's going on. Yeah, and then... then it's there. And then yeah. IT get a call saying, oh, such and such a thing is not working. And they're like, what is, what is that? We didn't know we had that. <laughs> and the problem is maybe there's no source control for it. There's not any testing. There's no way to check regression bugs. There's no, There's way no to, decent deployment pipelines. Yes, yeah. yeah, nobody knows anything. <clears throat> the way you get it into production is you very carefully try and draw the same picture in production as you drew in the <laughs> test environment, and I hope they line up. And uh, yeah. it's just very, there's a lot of problems that come about because of it. Uh, if you're doing something that is going to be customer facing, um, you, there's a lot of good engineering practice that you probably do want. And these low code platforms don't always provide that. But if it's just an internal report or some analytics, you say, oh, I wonder, you know, if these customers do these things, I'd like to be able to answer that question. Being able to do that yourself instead of raise a ticket with the data warehouse team and wait three weeks, you know, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, just being able to get that what I need to make a decision immediately. What happens near the end of um, one of these legacy displacement projects. From my experience, at, at a certain point, you have migrated all the important functionality, mm -hmm. but there's still a bit of legacy left yes. that is still doing its job, but the push from the business to replace it um, is not going to be as big. Yeah. Whereas to make sure that you meet your goals of no longer having that old legacy system there, you're going to have to keep investing to, yeah. to get that done. How do you deal with that? Yeah, I think there's a couple of tactics. I think one is when we talked about collaborating with the business in terms of how we slice the problem up, we also collaborate on the order that we do things. Mm -hmm. So hopefully the things that are left towards the end are low value. Right. You know, maybe these are things that don't generate much profit for the business, or there's only a small number of users who are using that part of the system. So, and then I think it's a business decision, because what you want to make sure is that the business are fully aware of the cost of providing that service. Right. Which is often a challenge, because what will happen in, again, in some organizations is they have one huge bucket, which is the IT budget. So if you go to them and say, what is the cost of delivering that type of service to those customers? Often that's not understood. And so when you actually get, and this is why you might even want some people from the finance department in the room, because what you want to do is say, okay, we can leave the legacy system on to support that part of the business, but they need to find the budget to pay to run it. <laughs> and that's a very powerful way of moving the conversation on. If you go and say, well, did you know that that costs half a million a year to run that? And only you are left. So unfortunately, we're going to have to, you're going to have to find the budget. And suddenly they're, oh, no, we can do that in a different way. We can use a different system. Or, or even more interestingly, it's like, well, if that's the cost, that's way more than the revenue we make from those customers. So we need to migrate them onto a different service instead. Is that a powerful leverage that you sometimes use? Uh, use is to make the discussion about cost versus. I think it's, I don't. I wouldn't call it leverage. I would just say it, it's sort of trying to have a mature conversation about. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the cost of delivering this service. And right. it, unfortunately, it's often not known. It, it's su surprising how often that a business can't tell you, uh, okay, this part of the system, we know it costs, you know, two million a year to run that, but what revenue does that part of the system generate? Mm -hmm. yeah. Often people don't know. And unless you know that, you can't make the right decisions about what order to migrate things in and which things you should turn off. So I remember we worked with a client who they dealt with packaging and they had like some of like 30 different sorts of packages that they dealt with. And IT spent several million pounds migrating all of the different package types. Yeah, supporting all of the... All the different... And we went to the business and they were like, why did they do that? Because only four of them make money for the business. <laughs> and right. we were going to retire the other 20 <clears throat> types of package. Anyway. Anyway. So right. why did they migrate them? They just wasted the money, you know. Yeah. So. I mean, you do, I guess when you do finally cross the line, right, it should be a bit of an anti-climax. Yeah. Well, it's double-edged, right? If, yeah. if you've managed to transform and change is now the norm, mm -hmm. then really it should be a, yeah. an anti-climax. You know right? you're successful. Because, yeah, you know you're but successful. But the users will just feel as if business continues. Mm. Yeah, Hopefully. but I think yeah. you should also have a big party, right? Yeah. <laughs> and celebrate, you know, celebrate the, the success. Because yeah. at the beginning, we've, we've agreed with the business what the, the kind of success criteria mm. or the, the drivers, the objectives of, of, of kind of tackling the legacy in the first place. And after the marathon, because these, these these projects aren't easy, right? No, these it's, are, never, these it's are, never a three month thing. Yeah. No, right, <laughs> exactly, right. Yeah. It's not, I, I, well, from what Alan was saying at the keynote, there's nothing soft about legacy software. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah you, you get to the end of what is a marathon. You need to celebrate that, right? You need to mm. celebrate. You need to call out all the people that have have, have helped and have played their part in in kind of this this achievement, mm. and and be able to demonstrate that you have met the success criteria and. You know, a transformed organization, um, hopefully legacy for them will be a, a thing of the past. And hopefully you've already had a couple of milestone parties yes. along the way. I mean, of right? Course, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> iterative developments or iterative parties. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> that's, that's the whole reason we do Agile, right? Just to have more parties. And more celebrations. <laughs> more celebrations. I think it's very important to, to celebrate success <laughs> with themes. Um, to put it in the spotlight, what people are doing. Um, I have this image from, from the IT crowd. Uh, you probably know the TV series where they always forget about IT mm. um, when they're celebrating things. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, that is something that does happen. Yeah. I, yeah, some, some, some organizations forget about IT when they're doing the annual planning as well. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. So no, celebrate your successes, do it a piece at a time. Um, and make sure that we involve the business in all of it. Yeah. I think that's what I'm going to take away from uh, the talk that mm. we just had. Is there anything that you guys want to add to, to that conversation? I guess I'd just say that um, we're continuing to write these patterns up. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the motivation and breaking the problem up, but there's also on Martin Fowler's website, we, we're writing up patterns that help you then implement it. So once you okay. have decided how to slice the problem up, and we're trying to get those out every few months, although Rob and I are often very visible, very right. uh, busy with client work, but we're publishing those on, on Marty's website. So if people right. are interested, they could go and have a look. They at, can go there. Yeah, okay. and yeah. read more detail on, on what we're doing. And they should come and see your talk this afternoon. Yes, this absolutely. Afternoon. Yeah. Come see the talk. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Perfect. listen to our technology podcast, the ThoughtWorks technology podcast as well, where we've been talking to Rebecca, our CTO, on this same topic. So. Yeah. Okay, okay, so go and look that up. And uh, thank you guys so much for uh, this conversation. Cool. Um, I learned a thing or two so uh, that I can take into my next project. Cool. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.